Hello, my name is John Baldwin, and I'm here to talk to you today about in-kernel TLS framing and encryption in FreeBSD. Uh, so for today's talk, we're going to start off talking first, what is KTLS? What do I mean by in-kernel TLS? Uh, once we've talked about that, we're going to talk about the TLS transmit path, kind of what some of the data flow looks like. And then we'll move on to the same thing about TLS receive and kind of some of the implementation details of the current uh, work on TLS receive. And lastly, I'll talk a bit about the current status of the work in terms of which bits have been upstreamed to where and which bits are not yet upstreamed and where they live if they're not. So first of all, before we can talk about um, TLS in the kernel, we need to, to say what is TLS itself. So in this case, TLS is transport layer security, so not thread local storage. Um, but TLS is an application layer protocol that typically typically gets layered over other network protocols, typically over transport protocols. Um, the role of TLS is it provides authentication and privacy so that you know, um, you have confidence about who you're talking to in theory at the other end of the connection, uh, and you're able to exchange data with the other end of the connection that other people cannot observe or cannot see exactly what you're sending and receiving. Um, TLS is structured as, uh, as its own protocol, as kind of a stream of records. And it has their own framing with their own little header and trailer, and then a payload of data, data that they carry. Uh, and these records have their own type, and they are sent over some kind of transport protocol, such as TCP. Um, TLS records, as I mentioned, have different types, and they contain different messages. So there are some messages that are specific to TLS itself, such as the handshake messages that are used at connection startup, in order for TLS to negotiate the session keys that are then used to encrypt the remainder of the connection. I mean, these session keys are ephemeral keys. They are generated once per a given socket and then thrown away, um, and they're not shared across multiple connections. And then there are application data messages uh, that TLS provides that the payload of those are just data from a higher level application, such as HTTP or IMAP or SMTP, um, that are carrying some higher level application data over using TLS kind of as a transport. So what do we mean by KTLS? So KTLS um, means we're going to do some parts of TLS inside the kernel itself. In particular, we're going to handle framing of data and doing encryption decryption inside the kernel. So we're going to be adding or removing framing data headers and trailers to data um, application data, and we're going to be modifying the data, encrypting or decrypting as necessary inside the kernel itself. And userland's view of the data is always going to be the decrypted data. So userland will write decrypted data onto a socket when using KTLS, um, and when using receive KTLS, it can actually read decrypted data off the socket as well. Um, but importantly, KTLS only handles kind of the bulk uh, data is part of, of a socket. It handles encrypting and decrypting the data after you've negotiated session, session keys. It does not handle the first few messages of a TLS socket when you're figuring out what those keys are going to be. All that work is still done in a user land library such as OpenSSL. And once OpenSSL has completed doing the handshake and computing what the session keys are going to be for this particular session, it then provides them to the kernel. So why would we do TLS in the kernel? Uh, TLS is an application layer protocol. Normally, application layers are things we kick out to user land um, instead of running even more code in the kernel at a higher level of privilege. So there are two main reasons that we, uh, for handling TLS in the kernel. One of the reasons is um, TL when you use TLS uh, currently, and when you're not doing it in the kernel, you lose the ability to kind of do zero copy send because in user land in your SSL library, you're having to encrypt the data. So you're having to read data. Any data that you want to send, you have to read it from the file belongs to. For example, if you're sending a file, a static content for a web server, you have to modify it in user land in place and then send the encrypted data out to your socket. So you don't get to use, for example, send file that can do zero copy send where the pages um, that are that hold the content directly to the file from the disk can be sent directly to the NIC and avoiding copies. And KTLS provides a way that we can get at least some of the benefits, or in some cases almost all the benefits of zero copy send with send file back. The second reason to consider doing TLS in the kernel is that there are a couple of different NICs on the market now that are able to do uh, TLS offload in the NIC itself. So they're able either to encrypt or in some cases decrypt traffic going in and out of the NIC 
as part of the, the, the traffic transiting the NIC itself. So they're able to take the encrypted data into the NIC, encrypt it before they send it on the wire, or in the other case, they're able to receive encrypted data, of TL, encrypted TLS data, and decrypt it before providing it to the host. And KTLS provides a framework to enable that functionality. So one of the things we need with, for KTLS is we need a notion of um, a TLS session inside the kernel. And that the role of TLS sessions is they describe the given set of keys and parameters for those keys used to modify data inside the kernel uh, when we're doing encryption decryption. So one of the things you have to know is you have to know what type of uh, algorithms you're using, what TLS calls a cipher suite. Um, this can be, for example, AES GCM for many modern um, connections, um, but you also have connections that use uh, uh, the CDC mode of AES combined with a MAC. And then you also have these specific keys for the given session. So you have the, the cipher key, and if you're using a separate MAC, the, the key for the MAC. Uh, the SSL library, once it's completed the handshake, provides these keys to the kernel by invoking new socket options via set socket. Um, and then these sessions, there's a data structure in the kernel that represents a session. It's associated with a socket buffer to hold the information needed to either encrypt data going out over a sen over for sending over a send socket buffer or to decrypt data received into a receive socket buffer. And in particular, you have separate sessions for transmit and receive because um, in TLS, you actually negotiate uh, different session keys for each direction. So first, um, let's talk about TLS transmit and kind of walk through a little bit of what that looks like. So when we're using uh, TLS offload or KTLS for transmit, all the data that uses LAN writes onto a socket um, is unencrypted data and the kernel is responsible for encrypting it. So userland doesn't do any encryption itself anymore when using KTLS. It just writes kind of raw plain application data directly onto the socket. If for some reason userland needs to send a specific kind of individual TLS record with a specific framing and a specific record type, for example, to send an alert from the SSL library, it can do that by calling send message and there's a new control message type specified that it can use to set the type of the message it wants to send. But otherwise, all the other data that userland sends, the kernel treats it as just raw application data, and the kernel chooses framing boundaries and then sets the, the type of the TLS record to be application data. So anything that's written directly with write or send file just gets packaged up by the kernel into TLS application data records. Um, we use a special type of mbuff to store these TLS records that is able to uh, it holds the header and trailer, the framing information about the TLS record is stored in the mbuff itself. And then for the payload of the data, it actually doesn't store the data kind of directly as a pointer inside the mbuff, but instead uh, the mbuff has physical address pointers to pages that are holding the, the payload of the TLS mbuff. Um, and when a TLS mbuff doesn't hold references data on the send side that has not yet been encrypted, it has a reference to the TLS session that's inherited from the socket buffer at the time that the mbuff is queued into the socket buffer. Um, and whatever is going to be responsible for encrypting the TLS mbuff is going to make use of this TLS session to find the keys and what algorithm needs to use to perform the encryption. So the first mode we'll talk about for transmit is software-based KTLS. And we're going to kind of walk through the data flow here. So we have some application data. In this case, we're going to use green to mean kind of unencrypted application data that, that we have in user land. In this case, the user land application is just going to call write, like it normally would to write data onto a socket. And that's going to be appended into the socket buffer as unencrypted data. But in this case, with KTLS, what we're going to do is we're going to mark this unencrypted data as being not ready. So uh, with this flag m not m, m buff flag m not ready that's stored in the m buff header. Uh, this is a piece of existing infrastructure that we already have in FreeBSD to deal with kind of data that's like, like reserving space in the socket buffer for data that is not there yet. So send file uses this when you want to send the contents of a file and not all of the pages associated with that file are currently resident in memory. It will go ahead and pre-allocate the pages for the data that's missing and schedule the disk I.O. to happen, but it'll mark the mbuffs as not ready. And when the disk I.O. completes and the, and the pages have been populated with the data from the file, then those, those mbuffs get marked ready and the protocol is able to send the data on down to the NIC. Then we're using the same thing here for software TLS. We're going to treat any data that's not yet been encrypted as not ready 
And then once it gets encrypted, we're going to clear this flag and mark it ready so it's eligible to be sent down to the protocol layer. So in addition to putting the data in the socket buffer and these inbuffs that are not marked not ready, we're also going to uh, schedule these inbuffs off to a queue that's serviced by a pool of worker threads that are responsible for doing the actual encryption of the inbuffs. And once the data has been encrypted, um, which <coughs> here is represented by these purple inbuffs, the contents of the inbuffs gets replaced with the encrypted data, and the end not ready flag gets cleared, um, which tells the protocol now that it's eligible to send this data. So now the TCP can pull any of the purple data that it wants to any of the encrypted data, make normal TCP packets out of it the way TCP normally would, and send them down to the NIC. And nothing in TCP or the NIC really has to understand the fact that TLS is happening at all. That all happened up in the socket buffer layer. Um, in particular, TCP has already understands how to handle the difference between not ready and ready data because of SIM files. So all the TLS knowledge is only up in the socket buffer layer when we're doing software KTLS. And then if instead of doing write, we do SIM file, the picture looks pretty similar. The only difference is that in this case, the um, unencrypted data, the green data, is coming straight from either pages in the VM cache uh, or from disk data requests if the pages weren't already memory resident. Now, one, one kind of quirk that comes up here, though, is that these pages that are from the VM cache are shared with other consumers of the file. So if you inmap the file, you're using the same uh, physical pages in memory. Or other sockets that are trying to send the same file, they also want to use the same physical pages in memory. So when we encrypt the data, we can't just modify those pages in place because then we would change the contents of, the, of people who have the file inmap to be the encrypted version. Um, and it turns out because there are different session keys for every socket, we actually have to have different copies of encrypted data per connection. So the purple data, in the case of SIM file, are actually separate copies per socket. So we have to make separate copies of the data, um, even though we have one copy that's the unencrypted green copy. When we, when, we tr when we encrypt the data and turn it into purple data, we actually have to allocate separate pages, copy the data and encrypt it into the new location, and then uh, send the purple pages down through TCP and out through the NIC. So there are two other modes um, for TLS transmit, but they're pretty similar. Um, they both involve having the NIC do the TLS encryption and segmentation onto the wire. Um, the first mode is called NIC KTLS, and in NIC KTLS, um, the NIC does kind of stateless TLS offload. So you send a request to the NIC saying, here's a TLS record, here's the session keys, the information for it, encrypt the record, chop it up into individual TCP segments and send it out into the wire. And the other mode is TOE-based KTLS, where TOE is a TCP offload engine. If your NIC fully offloads the TCP state engine and handle through transmits and so forth inside the NIC itself. Um, if the NIC also supports TLS, you can send the data directly to the NIC. And as part of doing the normal TOE transformations it's doing, it can also encrypt the data and send the data out on the wire. So in this case, when the, when the NIC is doing the TLS encryption, when we call write in the application, we're just going to copy the green unencrypted data down in the socket buffer, and we're not going to mark it not ready. We're going to go ahead and leave it ready right away and let the encrypted data go all the way down the TCP um, and then be passed on down to the NIC. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that we still have the, the, the inbus that represent TLS records in this case still have to account for the header and trailer so that our TCP sequence numbers are right to deal with uh, drop packets and retransmits and so forth. But the actual, the header might actually be populated by the socket layer, but the trailer is not. It's just zeros. Um, and it's not filled in until the NIC actually converts the data to encrypted. It actually turns it purple and, append, and replaces the trailer with the right trailer bytes as it's going out onto the wire. Um, but we still, the inbuffs have the right lengths to account for it in TCP sequence space, but it's still unencrypted data all the way down to the NIC. So in the case of SIN file, um, Right, again, we're getting the data from either the VM page cache or from the disk, disk data request sent to VM pages directly. But in this case, because we're not storing the encrypted purple data in the kernel anywhere that the kernel sees, we're actually able to use the same shared copies of the page that MMAP or anybody else of the file would use all the way down until it gets sent to the NIC and then the NIC transforms the data internally on the way out to the wire. Um, so in particular, this gives us the same kind of workflow and, and sharing of data that we would have if we weren't using TLS at all, but we're using SIN file, for example, on a web server. So no copies. So now let's move on from transmit and talk a little about the, about the receive side, which is some work I've been doing more recently. Um, so 
for receive side, the model we're going to use is that all the data that's received on the socket using KTLS receive, the kernel is responsible for decrypting that data. And Userland always gets fully decrypted data from the kernel when it, when it makes system calls. Um, Userland is going to get these data by calling, in this case, receive message. And every call to receive message is going to return a single TLS record, like a full TLS record, self-contained. And in particular, the TLS record is going to include a control message um, that's called TLS get record that includes the header and the payload of the receive message call because the normal data buffer is going to get the decrypted payload of the TLS record. The, the trailer is not sent at all to user land. So this is a little different structure from the send side where um, you could use send message if you want to, but you could also just do bulk kind of write or send file. Um, receive doesn't have anything analogous to that. Receive, you have to always use receive message. Um, and so one consequence of this is that the socket buffer for TLS receive is structured a bit differently. Um, it actually holds a list of TLS records, and, it's, and so in that way it looks more like a datagram socket, and that the TLS records themselves are stored as, as what kind of the socket buffer layer calls records that have a control message followed by a chain of inbuffs holding the, holding the payload data of the TLS record. And this is a bit unusual because the TCP is a stream socket, but we're actually making it look a bit more like a datagram socket in some ways, at least from the application's perspective. So let's walk through some of the data flow for what this looks like. Um, in this case, we're going to start with the first model of what's been implemented, which is support for a KTLS when you have a tow engine that is TLS aware and can do um, receive TLS. So in this case, um, the NIC, when it receives data, it actually will do the decryption um, and kind of strip the framing in the NIC itself. And then it provides uh, messages to the driver, you like receive messages that you would get in your receive uh, descriptors, for example, that are a full TLS um, frame or PDU that's been decrypted. So it's already decrypted. So it's already at this point green data and not purple data. The purple data was only on the wire. Um, the driver then will um, check to make sure that the, the NIC may have a way of reporting errors. For example, if there was a, a bad authentication, like an authentication mismatch, it can report that. But otherwise, if the, if the TLS frame was received, fine. The driver um, appends or prepends rather a control message with a TLS header and then enqueues it into the socket buffer. And so the socket buffer only holds kind of green um, already decrypted data. And then user land can retrieve that by calling receive message and get in the data into app, the application data directly. Um, so some more work I've been, I've been doing more recently actually is extending uh, this initial work for KTLS um, to support a software-based decryption where we're going to schedule the decryption of uh, TLS records inside the kernel using some kind of software backend or a code processor backend. So in this case, we're not relying on the NIC to do decryption anymore. So the NIC can be any old NIC that just thinks it's receiving kind of TCP packets just as if you were doing TLS in Userland. And so the NIC is receiving purple data. It's still encrypted and comes up into TCP and TCP is going to append that into the socket buffer. Um, and then kind of in reverse of what we did with um, software TLS retransmit, we're going to mark these, these kind of purple data as not being not ready um, because they're encrypted. It's not ready yet for Userland to read because Userland needs the decrypted data before it can read. So then once we receive some encrypted data, we're going to actually schedule um, we're going to queue those encrypted packets, their inbuffs, off to a worker thread to actually decrypt them. And when it does, it's going to turn them into green inbuffs, um, holding the decrypted data that userland can then receive the receive message. But there's some subtle differences between um, transmit and send, and I want to kind of dig into that a little more. So first, let's look at how TLS interacts with the send side and socket buffers in particular. particular. So, on the send side, when TLS is sending data, it uses the send socket buffer kind of in the usual way that you would if you weren't doing TLS at all. Um, it is still able to kind of queue TLS inbuffs uh, into the normal kind of single record that you have for a stream socket where you just have a single link list of all the inbuffs that's the current data in flight on that given socket. And part of the reason it can do this is one, each inbuff in this kind of link list in the stream just is self-contained and describes an entire TLS record. You don't have TLS records that span multiple inbuffs, so that you have to worry about um, how do I account for and ensure that I don't kind of lose part of a TLS record. They're all self-contained um, inside a single inbuff. Um, we are able to differentiate pretty easily between encrypted inbuffs and inbuffs that are, are not yet encrypted by use of the M not ready flag. 
So we can have both types of records live in the same chain of inbuffs because we can use the not ready flag to know which ones are eligible to go out to TCP and which ones are not. And then once we've actually encrypted a record, we're able to modify the inbuff in place because we're just changing the contents of the pages it points to. And then we're able to clear that flag. The size of the inbuff in terms of its length hasn't changed. Um, and now it's still kind of, and it's still the same inbuff and the same linked list. So we can kind of transparently convert one from not being encrypted to encrypted while living inside the same socket SIM buffer. But the receive buffer case is a little more complex. Um, first, decrypted TLS records are stored, as, as mentioned earlier, as records in the socket buffer. They have a control message and then they have um, a linked list of kind of inbuffs holding the decrypted payload data. And then you have these lists of records where the, the records themselves have pointers to each other, kind of like datagrams. Um, the decrypted records also don't have the trailer. So they have a little bit less data compared to a kind of a raw TLS record that has both the header and the trailer. So they're a bit smaller. Um, and then encrypted TLS records received from TCP, they're just like a normal chain of inbuffs. And you can have um, TLS records that span multiple inbuffs. You can have an, a TLS record in, inside of an inbuffs data area and a new one start in the same place so that you can have an inbuff that spans multiple as TLS records. Um, the header and trailer are both present, so the length is a little different compared to decrypted records. Um, and so partly because of this, you can't simply flip a bit of I'm not ready to say, oh, now I've taken a given TLS record and I've converted it from encrypted to decrypted. There's some more work involved. So let's walk through the steps that we have to do for a single TLS record to decrypt it. So the first thing we have to do is we have to wait for the record to kind of all be received because it might be spread across multiple TCP segments and we might get some of the segments and not get the others for a while. So we have to wait for the whole record to show up in our socket buffer before we can decrypt it. In theory, we could try to decrypt kind of the early part of the current record, but then we have to keep partial crypto state around like the current um, um, kind of IV for the next block of CVC, for example, or the current state of the hash like in the partial state so we can keep completing. But we have to get the whole TLS record in particular because the final hash that we compare against to determine if the record is valid is stored at the end of the record. Um, so we need to wait for the whole record to show up before we can decrypt it. So that's the first step. Then once we do that, we need to actually decrypt the record. We need to convert its contents from purple data into green data. Then we, once we, that's completed, we need to allocate a control message inbuff. We need to copy the TLS header into that control message inbuff and glue those together to build a record that we're going to append into the socket buffer. Um, we also, as part of that, have to, uh, the actual inbuffs that hold the payload, we don't want them to hold the header and trailer anymore. So we have to chop off some of the head and the tail of that inbuff chain to discard the header and trailer. And then, the whole time we're doing this, we're modifying the data and we're chopping heads and trailers off. Um, we also have to ensure that if um, this is happening asynchronously in some worker thread in the kernel, if the application exits and calls close, um, as part of that, we're going, to, uh, we're going to want to clear out all the data in the socket buffer when we close the file descriptor for the socket, which is going to call SP flush. And that would want to free all these inbuffs, but we can't free them out from under the worker thread that's trying to decrypt them. So we have to do something to make that safe and handle that race condition without having use after free bugs. And then finally, while we're playing these games with inbuffs and changing their size and adding control messages into them, we have to make sure that the socket buffer accounting is correct and sane during all these transitions. So I, how did I choose to do this? Well, I chose to do this in a unique way, perhaps. Um, and it's still up for debate if this is the best way, but this is how I've done it so far. Um, the first step I took is I decided to split the receive buffer into two different inbuff chains effectively. One for the purple data, one for the green data. So the normal inbuff chain, uh, which is kind of the MB chain uh, that's in a socket buffer, I decided that the best role for that to play to uh, play is to hold the already decrypted records, the ones that will be received by receive message. Um, the ones that are not yet been decrypted, uh, receive message needs to block and not try to read them anyway. So it's just simpler that we have uh, to only have the MB chain only hold fully decrypted records that are already ready for use line to consume. And this thing can be a linked list of records structured like a datagram socket would be. 
And then I've added a new chain called the NTLS chain into, this, into a socket buffer. And the purpose of this chain is only to hold a single record, like a string socket, of the kind of received raw packets from TCP um, with, with the payloads of those raw packets with still encrypted data that hasn't been decrypted yet. So now I, my kind of my socket buffer now is split into two different chains. One uh, green chain of the data that's already been received, and then the purple chain of the data that's not yet been decrypted. So then what are the steps, what does it look like to actually decrypt a TLS record to turn it from purple data into green data? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, after we've waited and we've got a whole record that showed up um, in our purple chain over an MTLS, we're going to actually detach that from the socket buffer and kind of pull off to the side. Um, I do a little bit of accounting gymnastics so that SB Flush will know that there's a, a, a single detached record hanging out somewhere and how long it is so it can account for it when needing, when needing to close out a socket buffer. Um, and then on the other side in the worker thread, we will notice um, after we've come back from decrypting if the inbuffs need to be freed and discarded. Uh, but this in particular, by detaching the record, or the, detaching the other record from the socket buffer, I'm able to not hold socket buffer locks. I'm able to do the encryption, or the decryption rather, um, in an environment where it's okay to sleep if I need to, or do locks or other things. So once I've detached the record, now I can actually do the work of decrypting it. So turning the purple data into green data. The next step is we need to trim the data down to get rid of the header and the trailer because um, we don't need the trailer anymore once we verify that's correct. And the header, we're going to save off and instead allocate a control message, which will be this little blue box, and save a copy of the TLS header in the blue box. And now those assembled together, those form a decrypted TLS record that we can append over into the normal um, MB chain. And also as part of the gymnastics of detaching um, the kind of bigger record with header and trailer from MTLS and then later attaching the new chain over into NB, we're able to make the socket buffer accounting kind of do the right thing and effectively subtract off the trailer in the last step from the size of the socket buffer. So then the last thing um, on TLS receive I kind of wanted to talk about is something I haven't implemented, but something I think is feasible. Um, there's a third mode of TLS that we have on transmit that we don't currently have on receive, which is kind of this NIC TLS where you don't have a tow engine, but you're still doing TLS decryption in the NIC. Um, so for this to work, the NIC has to receive data in order, and while it's receiving data in order, it can decrypt entire TLS frames and pass them up to the kernel in some way to say, hey, probably in a TLS MBUF with a, kind of the header in the trailer, um, but maybe marked in some way to say, hey, I'm an encrypted TLS MBUF. I have a valid header that's still in the inline header space, um, and I've been safely decrypted. And when that bubbles up to the top of our NTLS uh, chain, we can just uh, allocate a control message, copy the header over, and then slap it right back over into the MB chain without scheduling another worker thread to do anything. However, one of the tricks with NIC TLS is that if you receive data that's not in order, um, the NIC is not, in this case, it's stateless. It's not trying to manage the TCP state machine. It doesn't want to send AX or SAX or something to try to fill the hole. So instead, it's going to punt and send the encrypted data back up to TCP like it normally would and allow TCP to do whatever it needs to do to, to, to deal with the, with the packet loss and retransmits and getting that hole filled. Once then the hole has been filled, then the TLS record is going to bubble up through the MTLS chain as purple data. And then we can have the NIC driver use the same hook that's currently there for a software uh, back end to, to process an, an encrypted record and turn it into a decrypted record it can now notice, hey, I've received um, the record that I need. It's all been fully reassembled. Uh, I can decrypt it using some means, either perhaps the NIC has a way to decrypt it already using the hardware in the NIC or some kind of software decryption. And then also resynchronize with the state machine on the NIC to say, hey, we've recovered from a retransmit. You can turn on kind of TLS offload in the NIC on, for this connection again and start getting green MBUFs that will bubble up into MTLS and can be directly copied over into MB. Um, so I haven't implemented any of that, but I think uh, the, the framework, the model of having the split uh, worlds will work with that and not be too and be decently efficient at it. So the last thing I want to talk about is kind of what is the current status of this work. Um, we'll talk about transmit first. So the support, kind of the framework support for KTLS in general for transmit um, for the TLS 1.0 through 1.3 has already been merged into FreeBSD 13 current. It's already in head and will ship when 13 ships. 
Uh, I currently don't have any plans to try to MFC any of that back to 12 because it's pretty invasive and a lot of ABI breakage, but it will be something that all ships in 13. And this includes um, the ability to have software TLS backends or NIC TLS or Tobase TLS. Um, I've worked on NIC TLS and Tobase TLS for Chelsea OT6 adapters. Um, the folks at Nullnox are also working on NIC-based TLS for their adapters, which I believe some of that's already in head. Um, there are also some modules to support software TLS that are available. Uh, head itself includes this kind of generic module, KTLS OCF, that uses the kernel's open crypto framework layer to talk to different crypto backends, whether um, plain software, which is not very speedy, um, accelerated software like AES&I on Intel, or coprocessor uh, crypto engines to do, uh, in this case, TLS 1.2 and 1.3 encryption, so AES GCM. Uh, there's also a port that includes a software uh, version of KTLS that's optimized using ASNI that's derived from Intel's ESA-L crypto library, available as a port or a package that's already there listed on the screen. Um, Support for KTLS transmit for TLS 1.0 to 1.2 has already been merged into OpenSSL master and will be included when 3.0 is released. It's already included in the current 3.0 alpha. Uh, I have an open pull request against OpenSSL to add TLS 1.3. Uh, it's been kind of lingering for a while, but there's also another pull request from some folks working on KTLS for Linux that adds TLS 1.3. They actually used um, the FreeBSD one as kind of a, as part of the starting point that they based the Linux work off of. That one's got a lot of traffic recently. I've been helping to review that. Hopefully that'll get merged soon. Then I'll rebase the FreeBSD one and push to get that merged into 3.0, hopefully. Then on the receive side, um, KTLS receive for TLS versions 1.1 and 1.2 via the TOW method has already been merged into FreeBSD current and including TOW support on Chelsea OT6 adapters. Um, the work to do TLS receive via software is currently in progress. It's, uh, I have an open review um, with kind of the current work. Uh, and I know Rick Macklin has been testing it some for his NFS over TLS work. I know there's still some refinements I want to make, some improvements I want to make on the OCF side, perhaps to make it a little more efficient. But I hope to get that merged into the tree pretty soon. Um, the OpenSSL patches for that. I have another open pull request against that against OpenSSL. Um, that I'm hoping I can get pushed into 3.0 as well, if I can get it reviewed and merged. And then lastly, there are some outstanding patches against Nginx. These aren't required for KTLS, um, but they enable um, higher performance by making use of SSL SIN file so that you can use SIN file for serving static content over a TLS socket. And I have patches against both 1.14 and 1.16 currently that are derived from Netflix's patches from 1.14. Um, so what's next? What are some other things that are in progress or kind of future work related to KTLS? So one of the things I'm working on right now is I'm working on improving the performance of KTLS using the kind of generic OCF software backend. Uh, the goal of this work is to actually allow FreeBSD's existing ASNI support to be on par with the Intel ESA-L um, version that Netflix is using. And in general, to kind of overall improve OCF performance not just for ASNI, but for other, for example, coprocessor offloads um, or, or, or OCF and other architectures. Uh, another project I will probably start working on soon is adding support for some older versions of TLS to the OCF layer. Um, there's still some machines, in particular Netflix still has some clients that aren't using ASGCM but are using older versions of TLS that they still would like to use KTLS. And then uh, kind of a more pie in the sky idea is, and it shouldn't be too hard in theory, uh, would be extending the current software KTLS work to support TLS 1.3. Um, of course, if some small changes, they're not, they weren't huge for 1.3 for transmit, and they're probably similar in scope for 1.3. Um, part of this though is that 1.3 received doesn't exist in OpenSSL yet at all, um, for either Linux or FreeBSD, so part of the work is actually figuring out what the right interface is. For example, do you return uh, 1.3 plays some games with the message type and how it gets encoded um, and I have to figure out what OpenSSL wants to get in terms of the received header that we return to use land or as in the control message for receive message. Um, some other work uh, I'm working on is 
making the bits for OpenSSL available easily for users via either by patching OpenSSL in base or in ports. I have some open fabricator reviews against the security OpenSSL port to add backported patches to the OpenSSL 1.1. Uh, as well as a patch against, there's now an OpenSSL develop port that is a snapshot of three um, that uh, already has all the KTLS bits in, in the existing tarball that comes from OpenSSL. It just needs a knob to turn on the option. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to be able to provide those patches for Nginx available in the Nginx port. Um, I've already gotten pinged by the maintainer of the Nginx ports. So I know they're on board, uh, but kind of need to get the OpenSSL story figured out first before we can make progress on that. So that's all I have for today. Um, thank you for listening. I'll be around for Q&A after the talk. Thanks. OK, we're live now, ready for the Q&A. Go ahead. All right, thank you for uh, watching my talk on KTLS. Um, I wanted to start off with a couple of things before I get to some of the questions in the chat. Uh, First of all, uh, something I forgot to do at the end of this talk that I did previously is kind of thank the people who kind of did some of the early work in KTLS. In particular, uh, KTLS was really driven in FreeBSD by folks, by or by Netflix in particular. Um, so I know uh, Scott Long and Randall Stewart at Netflix kind of worked on a lot of the early design and the early the early approaches to KTLS and refined it. Um, Andrew Gallatin also did some work at Netflix. Uh, he added the, the kind of TLS MBUF work in particular, uh, and some of the other changes. Um, by the time I started working on KTLS, um, the bits that I worked on were extending it to support the NIC TLS modes and the TOE TLS modes. And I've also done work on receive side. My work in particular has been sponsored both by Netflix and by Chelsea. Uh, and then it's some updates relative to what I said at the end of my talk about the current work. Uh, the pull request for getting the Linux TLS 1.3 is still not yet in the tree, although I kind of ranted about it on the OpenSSL users mailing list yesterday and I had a bunch of traffic this morning, so I'm hoping that will get merged soon. Um, and I also have been talking, so patches to the OpenSSL ports actually got merged this week. So both of the uh, OpenSSL and OpenSSL develop ports now include KTLS options. They're not on by default, but you can turn them on. And uh, once that happened, the Nginx port maintainer had noticed, we had talked a bit earlier, and he reached out to me this weekend and actually came up with a patch for me yesterday that I, during the talk, actually was able to test. So I'm able to now use Nginx from ports built with KTLS linked against the security open SSL port, um, and it's working just fine um, using the SSL send file. So uh, I'll probably give some feedback to him. I had to make one little tweak to his uh, port patch. Um, so hopefully that will land soon. It, 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 again, I think it'll be an option to set on by default, but it'll now be possible to kind of build and get a working Nginx um, out of the box without having to use crazy trees from Git at least, at least for TLS 1.2 and 1.0 and 1.1 and, and on the transmit side. Um, okay, so why don't I get to questions? And I've got to look over here on another window to see questions. Make sure they haven't scrolled off. Okay, so the first question, someone said, Crest, will it be possible to get a data only file descriptor for a KTLS socket for with KTLS send and receive implemented? So in the send case, that's actually effectively what you get. Anything you write directly to the socket does get transparently um, encrypted by the kernel. And, and in fact, that's basically the whole point of enabling send file to work that way. An SSL send file is a very simple wrapper. And the SSL library that just checks to see does this socket using KTLS? If so, I'll do send file. Otherwise, I will just fail. Um, <clears throat> on the receive path is more complicated. We still need the ability on the receive side to know when there are messages that are application data messages and when there are messages that are actually like an alert or some, some other message or a request for a key exchange that we're not going to do because you don't do a key negotiation with KTLS like renegotiation. Um, but you still have to have the ability for the SSL library to see those. Uh, Maybe there could be something you would do with like out of band data in the SSL library instead. But what happens on the Linux side, and, and I've just used the same approach to keep the, the basically to make the diffs and open SSL smaller, um, is you have to use receive message to get each individual TLS uh, PDU or frame out of uh, the, re the receive side. The receive side, so it's never going to be just a straight read and you get your data. Um, if we ever had a kind of receive file system call, we could probably make that work in some sense. Um, but we don't really have something like that in FreeBSD. Let me look at the next question. 
do you all right so deb drop well i know you have your a real name but i'm going to call you by your irc handles um do you know if the work by rick macklem on tls encrypted nfs is going to benefit from ktls uh, my understanding is that NFS over TLS wouldn't really be very feasible without the KTLS work, in fact. Um, and I think he kind of waited for me to get some of the initial KTLS RX stuff prototype for him to start building on top of. Um, so definitely the NFS over TLS is going to make use of the KTLS infrastructure. Otherwise, you would have to, I mean, NFS wants to live in the kernel and doesn't want to be, and it's kernel implemented as not a user space file system. And if you didn't have KTLS, you would basically have to make it be a user space file system one way or another. So certainly it depends on the KTLS work, I think, to be practical. All right, so DevDrop asked another question I think I might have answered. So does KTLS benefit from ASNI um, since that's conceptually software as opposed to like Hyphen and UbiSec? Um, so I, had, I did answer this question a bit in the talk, but I also wanted to mention one thing in particular. Um, what we call software TLS in or software KTLS is just a notion of using some kind of backend that will encrypt the data before it gets sent down to TCP. And that can actually take different forms. It can be a pure software. And if you actually use the plain C software, it's not very fast. Um, or it can be an accelerated software like ASNI or something using vector instructions and so forth. Or it can even be an asynchronous coprocessor engine. So one of the things I do test is using the coprocessor engine on the Chelsea T6 um, and using that to actually do software encryption. It uses a software mode via of the Open Crypto Framework, um, but it's not NIC TLS. It's not the it's the data is not being encrypted as part of the transmitting to being put onto the wire. So it's still called software KTLS even if it's using a coprocessor. Uh, a question from Crest, how much did the kernel of crypto framework have to change for KTLS? So we didn't have to make changes to get KTLS to function and to work um, with KTLS, but it does not perform as well as if you write a uh, simpler uh, software model, for example, that uses ASNI. In particular, that's why Netflix has uh, that other uh, software backend that's based on the Intel ESA L library. Uh, that performs much better than when you're using ASNI. Um, so for example, on the box I'm using for testing, um, I currently have ASNI up to about 40 gigabits per second when using ASNI via the OCF interface um, and using the module built right on top of Intel Visa L, it's more like 50 gigabits a second that it can send. Um, so part of my work, and I'll, I might mix up some questions here, part of my uh, recent work on OCF in particular is trying to actually bridge that gap and find inefficiencies in our OCF layer and allow it to perform on par with a more straightforward software implementation, um, such as Intel's ESA L. But it's not even the ESA L, it's more about the glue to get down to where you're actually using the ASNI instructions. Um, it's about minimizing some of the overhead and stuff that we have there. All right, another question from Chris. Is someone working on socket splicing for KTLS to offload things like HA proxy with re-encryption? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, all the work that I've been working on, um, like Netflix's use case is send file. Like they're not even really interested in receive, they're interested in making sure that they can do send file and basically do zero copy when possible for sending out the, the, the content that they're sending to their clients. Um, and in the case of Chelsea, uh, their, one of their main motivations is just enabling the TLS abilities they have in their NIC, whether it's TLS via toe um, or the NIC TLS um, modes as well. It's, it's really about enabling that hardware and allowing people to use TLS offload. And the primary market really for that is true is things like HTTPS um, and not necessarily, so I don't, I haven't really looked at that. I haven't anybody asked me about doing something like socket splicing and I don't know anyone who's working on that. Oh, let's see. Uh, another question from Chris. How much work would it be to add KTLS to GNU TLS? Probably not a ton, and the work should mostly be portable. Um, for example, if you wanted to add the KTLS support for Linux, um, it probably about the same amount of work. Uh, in OpenSSL, the amount of code, there's some, some of the code is different, in particular, how you fill out the socket option to upload keys is different between Linux and FreeBSD. 
Um, but some of the other changes are shared between the two of them, such as all the changes. So there's some changes in the data path to know that when you're using KTLS, you don't actually do the encryption, you just send the, the data as it is. Or if you need to send a record that's not application data, you need to use send message and so forth. And that's all shared. None of that is OS specific in OpenSSL. Uh, you can kind of look at the patch to the OpenSSL port um, in particular that adds KTLS support for that and see how that compares. Uh, and in order to get a sense of how much changes you would have to make for GNU TLS. Hang on a second. Someone got it. Uh, and similar for, you also mentioned bare SSL. I think in general for any SSL library, it's probably a similar amount of work to the changes that happen in OpenSSL. Okay. Um, just to clarify, I think a question that Crest might have asked earlier in regards to the plain socket. Um, with KTLS, all the key exchange and key negotiation is still done in user land. We don't want to put like that bit into the kernel. It's really the kind of bulk encryption stage where you're doing the kind of similar work you do with IPsec even. Um, when you're just doing um, AES of some form, you know, ASCBC or GCM or some, or some such, um, to, try to encrypt the actual TLS records themselves, it's not really with the session keys. Um, we're not really interested in doing the, the key kind of negotiation in the kernel itself. And the same is even true of IPsec. Um, IPsec, uh, all the key negotiation and stuff, like if you want to run an Ike daemon and so forth, that all happens out in the user land. We don't run that in the kernel either, but we do allow the kernel to do the encryption decryption of individual packets. And so a similar model is true for KTLS. Just one does FreeBSD have real send multiple message and receive multiple message? Yes. I think they are system calls and not just wrappers and libc. We certainly have the functions. I believe they are an actual system call, but I don't, I would have to double check the code to make sure myself. Yes, software KTLS, so Deadrop asked a question, can software KTLS be something like the neon stuff on ARM or RISC-V vector extensions? Yes, so in particular, the, the limited, so we do have like a little ARM V8 uh, crypto module, although it currently doesn't do ASGCM, which means it's not particularly useful for TLS, at least modern TLS. Someone enterprising should, should add GCM support to it to make it more useful. Um, but for example, using AS extractions on ARM would also fit into software KTLS. Oh, a question from Crest. What about Cha Cha 20 and Poly 1035? Um, so I would be interested in working on that. It's, it's not clear that there is a lot of demand currently for that. I was also talking with the folks at SemiHalf who have clients who use IPsec on FreeBSD. And there's also um, the one of the most recent RFCs of the ciphers you should use on IPsec does recommend that implementation should implement. There's a specific AEAD combination of Cha Cha 20 and Poly 1035 that has RFCs for both IPsec and TLS. Um, the framework should permit adding it. <clears throat> um, not too bad. In particular, we should be able to add a new cipher to OCF to support that particular combination as an AEAD algorithm, um, in which case we'll be able to use it both for IPsec and TLS. Uh, but now I'm not aware of uh, SemiHalf didn't have any of their clients who are interested in working on it. I don't think currently um, Netflix, for example, is interested in it because I don't know that there's demand yet for clients who are actually trying to use that for TLS. Uh, but when the time comes, it should the framework should support adding that as another cipher. Oh, and yeah, I should clarify because somebody tried to answer an IRC. There is, we, in OCF today, we do have support for Cha Cha 20 as a cipher, and we have support for Apollo 1035 as a digest. But when you're using them for IPsec and TLS, there's actually like a unique combination. It's not quite, uh, when you mix AES-CVC with an HMAC for TLS and IPsec, you actually just run, um, they, well, they run in different combinations, but effectively you kind of run them independently from each other. Uh, for Cha Cha 20 and Poly 1035, there's actually a specific combination. You use a single key that you derive the Poly 1035 key and the Cha Cha 20 key from, for example, 
and there's a specific way you can strike the AAD um, and how you kind of do that. It's not just running the two algorithms independently. So we do need to build a Cypher and OCF that is the support for that AAD mode that combines those two things. Okay, that's the answer, Dev Drop. What I meant by ASGCM, the ARM V8 crypto kind of backend for OCF does it, that uses the AES instructions for ARM V8 does not do GCM, it only does CDC. Um, that's what I was talking about. For, like ASNI on x86 does do GCM, for example, and we have a plain C version of GCM, which is what you'll end up using on ARM V8 if you're trying to use uh, KTLS with the ASGCM, for example. Might be running out of questions. So Crest asked, could the key exchange be put into a different user space process? Uh, I mean, that's the key exchange right now is fully handled in user land using whatever your SSL library tries to do. If you wanted to add add PrivSep, for example, to OpenSSL to do that, you could, but that's kind of orthogonal to KTLS or not, um, because that's just a matter of doing that work. And then once you get the session keys, doing the second option, a socket option to provide the session keys to the kernel. So that's not really specific to KTLS, and KTLS doesn't really have a same bearing on that one way or another. OK, so I think. That is all the questions that I see. I'll hang out for a little bit longer in case there are any more questions that come up. So now I'm also probably a little bit lagged. Um, but thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks to Dan, as always, for hosting this conference. You're welcome. Thank you. I was, ju I was just about to say, you don't have to finish before the yes. next session starts. But if you're done all the questions, that's good. I think the traffic on IRC has slowed down, so I think I might be done. Okay, I'm going to stop the live stream then. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dan.